Uh, moving into the into the meeting itself, the first item on the agenda is the adoption of the minutes of the J April 12, 2012 meeting in Miami. Do I hear a mo motion for their adoption? I, I move adoption. Do I hear a second? Is it is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? No, Mr. Chairman, um, the minutes refer to uh, the fact that I spoke and, uh, and the board had voted to put the uh, draft consolidation report on the website in the minutes. And it's my understanding that uh, not all of the consolidation report was put on the website. The part relating to salaries for uh, the grantee heads was deleted or not put on. Is Am I correct in that understanding or page 28 or am I mistaken? Does somebody from management have a... Uh, yes, I, I have part of the answer. Um, yes, there were two graphs that were excised due to sensitivities. That was a management level decision. Well, my question is, since the board voted to put it on, why did it not come back to the board as to why uh, at least one page as it relates to salaries. I assume it's salaries. And by the way, I should point out these salaries are available on the IRS 990 form. And if anyone is curious to know what Libby Lou, Steve Corn, or Brian Conov make, they need only pull out the 990 form with IRS, and, and there it is. So why why would you take it? Up? Why would we do this? One, why would we do it? And two, what, after the board directed it to be done. Why was 98% of what the board directed done, and one, and this portion was deleted, and we weren't told about it? Governor, I assume that there was a sensitivity because of the salaries, and a decision was made at the senior staff level, which I signed off on, to perhaps save some embarrassment, because it was not only the director's salaries, but other senior and middle manager uh, salaries that were involved, and it was totally pre-decisional. My question is, why didn't you, with the board having voted to do it, why didn't you at least advise us of this or come back to us? Yep, we should have. If you'd like, we could still put it on, Governor. Um, yeah, it's on. Can I say something? Um, this is Libby from RFA. Uh, we did um, ask, and it's Libby from RFA. Can you hear me? Um, Libby Lou is speaking from RFA in Washington, and she has some added information, Governor's. Um, one of our concerns at RFA was that having the um, benefit, especially comparison information for the whole organization, on the website might affect our union negotiations, which we are going to renegotiate our collective bargaining agreement. So um, we thought it was not appropriate to have that. And we noted that it was not published on the BBG Watch, therefore it was not already in the public space. So, uh, so President Lou of RFA said that one of the concerns that she has at Raider Free Asia is that if we put benefit information um, about other companies inside of U.S. international broadcasting on the website, which is not public information, that somehow that would adversely affect the company's negotiations with labor unions since that information is not uh, made public. Uh, I do uh, concur with you that as public employees, everybody's salaries eminently, some, some are eminently findable. Uh, I am sympathetic to President Lou's point of, of uh, in the middle of negotiations. Okay. Well, perhaps we can offline find a solution that's acceptable to Governor Ash, um, and 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 also be respectful of the need for confidentiality and embarrassment. So, uh, is that all right with you, Governor Ash? Well, Mr. Chairman, here's my concern. Uh, I think Mrs. Lou makes some uh, valid points, but. I have a problem with the board votes to do something. It's like the discussion we had on Burma a few, an hour ago. We vote to do something that doesn't happen. All I'm saying is there may come up to be very valid reasons as to why something didn't happen. Well, but someone ought to share them with the board I, and, and let us know. Now, Mr. Lobo apologized <coughs> for not doing it, and I accept his apology. All I'm saying is it shouldn't happen again. Secondly, that portion of the salaries that's available on the IRS 990 is available to anyone on this planet Earth that wants to go to the Internet and pull it up, including benefits, including bonuses. So why would we eliminate? I mean, the labor union can see that. Now, if there are other salaries at a lower level that are not included, that's another issue. Well, I, I think 
I think but, your point uh, is well taken. Uh, it, it's right there. Okay. So why are we hiding it? Um, I think we'll work quite a And what's a confidential about it? There is nothing confidential mm -hmm. about what Steve Korn makes, Libby Lou makes, or Brian Conniff. Okay. It might not be enough, but it's not, uh, it's not confidential. All right. Um, with that understanding that we'll work to, to make the information that should be available available, do I, uh, it's moved and seconded the minutes of April 20th be approved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. We're going to approach things on the agenda a little bit differently today um, to recognize the importance of the work that's being done, the actual substantive work that's being done by our broadcasters. We're moving the reports of the heads of the networks forward in the agenda. So at this time, I'd like to call on the Office of Cuban Broadcasting Director, Carlos Garcia Perez, to make a short report. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I hope this becomes the standard in the future, and that, I, I mean, otherwise these folks are going to get shortchanged. Well, and, they did uh, get shortchanged last time. Um, uh, and I, I would hope in the future, because we have as a board more interaction with Mr. Lowe and Mary Jean Bueller and others, and less with the grantees and Mr. Enzer, and while he's not here today, uh, I would hope what's point B on here might, we ought to, the governance committee might consider whether or not this should be the regular order in the future. Happy to do that. Um, Carlos Garcia Perez. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank um, the board for allowing me to have a, a short notice closed session. I, I know it was a governor's um, briefing session this morning, but I, it was very important uh, for me to be able to, do, to, to inform certain things that we're doing uh, here at the Martis. I, I want to be very brief, but I want to start to by thanking Governor Anders Wimbush for his tremendous help leadership in helping the Martis to develop the strategy that's in place today. Um, he came down to Miami at least twice outside of regular meetings to help us develop and set forth our strategy which is in place today and I'm very happy to report as the board knows that's been very successful. We've been able to execute it on it. I think um, I'm not uh, discarding the other folks that have helped us. Uh, Governor Meehan has been part of the strategic uh, uh, committee too, and I think uh, others have been very helpful. But Anders took the, the time to come down here uh, on separate meetings to help us develop the strategy that is in place today and, and that we're very happy with the way it's been executed and with the strategy. So that's, that's, uh, that's my first report. Second report is another thank you to Under Secretary Sunshine and, uh, and Nick for helping us with a certain license that we have been trying to get for a while. The license is in place now and we're trying to establish all the proper procedures to execute on it. This license will uh, turn around uh, and it's a sea changer and I'm stealing a quote from Tish King on the way we have been doing business for the last 27 years. Um, so I really want to uh, thank the Undersecretary and her staff for helping us uh, in achieving uh, this license. It was in place. They just, I think they gave it a little push. And last but not least, this is my, th this is like a thank you report. I also want to thank Susan Andrews. Susan Andrews, I heard yesterday she's going to retire from the BBG. Susan Andrews has been tremendous with our initiatives and communication on the Hill. I still remember my first board meeting. I wasn't even hired. And we all agree that I had to be up in the hill speaking with all the staffers, representatives, and senators. And Susan Andrews has done a tremendous job uh, helping me meet with all those folks. And, and she's got tremendous credibility with the staffers and the representatives on the hill. So I'm, for one, I'm going to miss her tremendously. So I, I want to make sure you that... Have anything else other than thanks? We could move along. Yeah, I got my report. And it's gonna, go. we can go to the tape. We have questions. That's please. it. Okay. I'm done, Dennis. We can are play you, the tape. Do you have, well, wait a minute. There are questions. Hold on. I thought you said you had a report. Well, that was his report, apparently. Was that the report? That is my report. My report's on video. I just want to make sure that I thank these three folks. Do you have questions? The report's on So video. we can go to the tape. Well, I think he's showing some programming highlights. Did you have questions? Well, my, I haven't seen the video. Is, there, is the video likely to trigger... 
some inquiry. I mean, it's hard to ask questions on a video you haven't seen. Well, I think the I don't know if it's going to ask questions. If there's going to be questions or not, I would like to play the video, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Oh, so it's the program, Mr. Chairman, that plays the video, and then if a board member has a question, we why don't we play the video, and, and then if there are questions, yes, why don't we play the video? Ah. Oh. On the coattails of Pope Benedict XVI's visit to Cuba, the topic of religion and Cuba continue to go hand in hand. Invited by the Cuban Archdiocese, Cuban Americans return to the island for a conference. Meanwhile, Cuban Archbishop Jaime Ortega's visit to Harvard University unleashed a wave of controversy, and Radio Marti celebrated a birthday. On April 19th in Cuba, the church sponsored a conference on the topic of Cuban immigrants and invited Cuban-American academics back to the island. To improve the relationship between Cuba and the Cuban diaspora. One week later, Cardinal Jaime Ortega, Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Havana, spoke at Harvard University. Answering questions from reporters, he referred to a group of 13 men and women who occupied a church in Havana as criminals of low cultural level whose actions were part of a plan set from Miami. His words ignited a series of reactions in Cuba and abroad. A Marti editorial addressed the controversy and received widespread support, sparking a healthy debate amongst Cubans on the island. While elements of the Catholic Church in Cuba sided with the Archbishop, dissidents such as Oswaldo Payá, a prominent critic of the Castro government, engaged directly with the church, criticizing it on the same grounds as the Marti editorial. Well-known opposition leader and ex-political prisoner Dr. Oscar Elias Besset wrote an article and called the Cardinal's words traumatic and described the church's occupants as peaceful and patriotic. Avanza Cuba, Cuba Forward, the popular radio and TV Marti program also focused on the role of religion in a free society in a post-Castro Cuba. Inmate TV Marti followed Mariela Castro Espin, Raul Castro's daughter, and Fidel's niece as she made her way from San Francisco to New York City. Castro was the director of Cuba's National Sex Education Center and was in the U.S. to speak about gay rights. Castro didn't shy away from talking politics. Her controversial visit didn't go without protests from Cuban Americans. This group was denied access to her events and kept at a distance by local authorities. Martinoticias.com teamed up with Radio Liberty and covered the elections in Russia. The website collaborated with VOA in Havana and illustrated every detail of the Cuban Biennale. A Martinoticias.com report shed light on a connection between Swedish furniture maker IKEA and Cuban prison labor. The investigation by Cuban blogger Jorge Luis Garcia was based on the information found in the old East German Stasi archives. The Martis had extensive coverage of the controversy, including reaction by Cuban Americans in the House and Senate. May also brought the return of the annual Cuban Nostalgia Festival to Miami. The three-day gathering celebrates Cuba's culture and glorious past. This year, Cuban Nostalgia marked the 110th anniversary of Cuba's independence. That same date, May 20th, coincided with the very first Radio Marti broadcast, 27 years ago. I've been here 26 and a half years and after all those years the greatest thing I've seen is the analytics that have come about recently through social media where we're actually able to measure our audience. So while we have new tools to work with we're still doing the same thing we were doing 27 years ago and that's providing Cuba with fair and balanced news and information. Thank you Carlos. Carlos can you Thank hear me? you Mr. Chairman. That's my um, report. Let me see if there are, I think maybe Governor Ash has a question. Uh, my question, uh, uh, Mr. Garcia, is uh, along the lines which I've asked before, basically just to have an update. Um, as you are aware, you inherited, all of us did, uh, the uh, legal action of, that was brought under your predecessor, or maybe two predecessors back, in regard to some people that were riffed and, and let go uh, by previous action. And... Uh, the, the uh, Labor Relations Board in the court, I believe, ruled against OCB, uh, and that's now been appealed. Uh, and where does that stand in terms because 
as you know, I raised some questions without taking sides on whether I think it should be appealed or not appealed. It does represent a, a roll of the dice in terms of the financial consequences uh, to the board and to the American taxpayer if the appeal fails. Uh, and the appeal may take two to three years, and the exposure may be in excess of $3 million because if you lose on the appeal, you, you add three more years of interest, late charges, uh, attorney fees, the whole bit. Um, and I know it, and, uh, and you all indicated in a prior case that the panel that will initially hear this, you expect to lose in, and then you would go into federal court. And have you been to the panel yet? If so, what's happened? If not, when is it scheduled? And thirdly, do you have to get Department of Justice and the Solicitor General's approval in order to uh, take it into a federal court? Uh, Governor, if, if Paul Comodorsi is, is, is with you guys, I'd like to defer that to him. I'm not extremely familiar with the, the process. Um, I know that, that it's an ongoing process and that we, we are appealing the process. But if, if Paul can help me out, with, uh, I would appreciate it. Um, Thank you, and I'll be very brief. Uh, we did uh, disagree with the arbitrator's decision. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, we uh, filed exceptions with the arbitrator's decision with the Federal Labor Relations Authority. We have not heard back from them. When would you anticipate they have to hear your appeal? Uh, it's a written appeal. It's not a hearing. It's a written appeal. Oh. It's all it was brief. Um, there, there's no hearing. And uh, we don't know when we'll hear back from them. All right. Once the decision's made, whichever way it might go, does either party, the losing party, have a right to appeal that into to another level? I guess we would make an assessment at the time. I didn't say whether you will. I said, do you have the right to? Uh, I would have. To, it would probably depend on the type of decision that they, they make, whether we would or we wouldn't. Um, and I, I feel, I, I'm not, I don't have a sufficient, you know, expertise sitting right here to talk about this, but I'd be very happy to brief you offline about this case. Um, and, uh, and I believe that we actually have at one point in time in the past, but we'd be happy to provide another briefing. Well, just for the benefit of my colleagues, we have discussed this in the past, but that was many months ago and time has gone by and this is an issue I think is of importance because there's several million dollar exposure out there uh, that uh, this board could be hit with in a time when you're being uh, we're wrestling with recommendations to make tough choices to make um, I think we all need to be alert to the fact uh, that this is there and I am a little bit surprised that you apparently can't answer whether or not either party has the right to appeal. Obviously, the content of the decision would determine whether you want to appeal, and that's a wise judgment for the other side. But surely you would know if you could. Yeah, briefly, because we do have a long agenda. And I, I, have, I, have, I have a, a question, too. Uh, okay, I, I'm just... Uh, oh, this is, oh, this, is uh, this is a Federal Labor Relations I can't... I know you and Mr. Corner talking back and forth, and maybe okay. he's your attorney on this. Yeah, I, I think it's better if I talk to you. just to answer off, uh, answer off line. Susan, you had a question. Yeah, I do. Um, if, if I could jump in, I, it sounds like, Paul, maybe you and Governor Ash need to have a, a sidebar on this particular issue. But thank you, Carlos, for that highlight reel. And Governor Ash, I agree with you. I would love to see the portion with the entity heads and our directors at the front end of our board meetings reporting on content and progress because that's why we're all here. Um, but specifically, Carlos, there was one little clip in that reel that talked about a partnership with Radio Liberty and Voice of America. Can you tell me that how that came about and how it worked? Well, it, it's something. Um, I'd be glad to, uh, Governor McHugh. It's something that, that that we do more and more. And and when there's an event that we think is going to be relevant to our audience, we call our colleagues on VOA or any of the of the other entities. And we share content, and a lot of times they even lead us to some of their stringers that they have in these particular countries, and they work with us. So it's a, it's, it's a huge help, and, and really helps us generate good content. 
So he's basically picking up the phone and, and calling the, the, the Burton party and, and telling him what is it that we need. And 100% of the time, we get full cooperation. That's very great. good. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, uh, I'd like to ask the president of RFERL, Chief Corn, to make his report. To the VO, VOA oh. director. Oh, I'm sorry. I went out of order. Um, so why don't we go to, oh, sorry, we'll go to uh, VOA, and then we'll go to RFERL. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor Malt. Uh, yes, David, Steve Reddish. Sure as I understand. Go ahead. Yes, David Ensor is on travel, and uh, I will fill in for him as uh, as briefly as possible. And I thought I'd start with David's trip. Um, there's a photo that uh, we we can we, I would like to show um, where he is signing a, a breakthrough agreement with the Director General of the Myanmar State Radio and Television uh, to place VOA English teaching programs on. Um, Burmese terrestrial radio stations. Under the agreement, Burmese radio, the radio network will carry VOA four-minute feature reports three times a week. Um, we're hoping it's a first step to a greater cooperation down the road on both radio and television. Um, our Burmese service chief, Luin Than, and IBB's Doug Boyton were there with David. Um, he also held talks with Burmese Minister of Information, who expressed his support for greater access to his country, including his decision to issue multiple visa entries, multiple, multiple entry visas for VOA reporters. Um, before going to Burma, um, and we have another photograph, uh, David had a stopover in Thailand where we met with Bangkok Bureau uh, employees and went to Cambodia where he and the Khmer Service Chief Chris Deckard met with VOA Stringers and dropped by the RFA office and visited with U.S. and Cambodian officials. In this picture, you'll see David sitting as he listens to Cambo a Cambodian Buddhist monk during his visit to a stupa, which houses the remains of victims of the Khmer Rouge regime at a former detention center. Um, one of the other big stories that we have been covering at VOA is Syria. It's uh, a huge story, obviously, for MBN, but it's also one of the most important stories for VOA audiences in Iran, as well as those in the, who speak Kurdish and our English language audiences. Um, VOA's Elizabeth Arrett managed to get into Syria early in May to produce a series of radio, TV, and Internet reports. Um, a stringer from uh, London, Henry Ridgewell, also produced several TV reports from the Syria-Turkish border. Scott Bob, our J Jerusalem correspondent, was in Lebanon, and uh, he was there when pro- and anti-Syrian factions in Lebanon began clashing in Tripoli and Beirut. And not long ago, a VOA Persian team, composed of Rudy Bakhtiar, Siavash Sanditian, and Afshin Naraman went to the Turkish-Syrian border where they got a first-hand look at the Syrian exodus triggered by the violence there. Uh, they went to several refugee camps and uh, produced a video, and I've got about a minute and a half's worth of video that I'd like to show. So roll the video. Rehanli refugee camp in Turkey, home to over 3,000 refugees, many of them children. The Turkish government provides the basics, a school, a playground, even some modest toys. At first glance, the children seem happy and playful, but inside these small tents they now call home, the reality of their lives is much harder to hide. 13-year-old Sarah is from Homs, the focus of an intense military crackdown for months. She says shelling destroyed her home. There was blood all over the place. The regime started killing people because they thought they were armed. Mustafa Harmouche is the nephew of General Harmouche, one of the first defectors of Bashar Assad's army, who was later kidnapped, brought back to Syria, and forced to confess on national television. Mustafa's other <coughs> uncle was found tied to a tree gutted like an animal. They arrested my uncles, and they killed my uncles. 
The United Nations says over 400 children have been killed and hundreds injured since the violence began last year. But there is no way to measure the psychological scars of the brutality these children have witnessed, painfully evident, not just in their faces, but in their drawings, in their playing, and even in their dreams. What do you want to do when you grow up? The children did that for me. I'd love to be a soldier to protect Syria. Rudy Batyar, Rehan Lee Turkey, Voice of America. And as we all know, the situation has gotten much worse in Syria and uh, along the, the border in Turkey where the refugees are. I want to close with um, a, a photograph. Syria's got a, a significant Kurdish-speaking population, and our Kurdish service provides daily uh, coverage of Syria. This picture was posted on a Kurdish civil rights activist Facebook page which shows a Syrian Kurdish child at a rally thanking our Kurdish service for its coverage and uh, for launching its radio on television broadcast, which allows many Syrian Kurds to watch and listen to VOA Kurdish for the first time, thanks to its um, being available on satellite. How large is that audience, Steve, VOA Kurdish? I don't have the figures right now. Um, the measured audience in, in Iran uh, is in Iraq, actually, where, where we really did the uh, the survey, was went up to about 5.3 percent. I don't know what that translates into numbers, but it was down low. It has risen in the last year. Um, I can get you those numbers afterwards. Who is, who is competing with you in providing services in Syria? Um, do you know where? what other sources of information? As far as Kurdish language is concerned, um, there are uh, various different Kurdish radio stations that broadcast, but I don't know of any that are actually getting information from Syria to broadcast um, to Syria. Um, most of the uh, Syrian language, uh, the, the Syrian uh, broadcasters are in Arabic. And, uh, so are you saying we're it? We are, we are basically it as far as being able to uh, get information to the Kurdish population. And how many reporters do you have on this? Um, there are uh, approximately. approximately 12, including uh, including contractors, approximately 12 Kurdish um, language service people, and uh, we have about five stringers in the region. On the Arabic side, who is providing the information that is also reaching the Arab-speaking parts of the country? That'd be Al Hura and, and Radio Sawa. Uh, and we have direct reach in with the direct to home satellite TV. And then we have uh, radio transmitters both in Jordan and in Lebanon that broadcast into Syria. Obviously, we can't have FMs in the country, but we do get a fairly good uh, signal into Damascus and a couple of other major cities. Any sense of your market penetration in um, Syria? The last survey that was done uh, two or three years ago was a telephone survey, which has inherent limitations, but it was actually fairly large. I, I want to say 20 percent. Do you remember, Bruce, uh, offhand? About that, yeah. Uh, we were surprised and pleased. Uh, we're, I think one is, another one has been done. We just haven't gotten the results. Is that correct? Uh, there, there is a new survey in that uh, confirms strong performance by both al Hura and Radio Sile in, inside of Syria. Uh, and we make that available to, mm -hmm. to the board. I'd love to see a, a sure. Syrian sum, a summary sure. of Syrian, sure. our activity and the uptick, too. Mm -hmm. And the others that are broadcasting in there that are also making up the 80%, what, what do you think the chief services are that are also reaching Syria in Arabic? Well, uh, the, the typical uh, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, um, uh, I don't know, Bruce, if you remember what the, this recent survey that just came out uh, says. Um, there are Syrian uh, stations that actually have fairly high uh, viewership. Um, whether they're believed or not is another matter, but uh, they, they do. Uh, they are viewed, I think, up as high as 80% of the people in the country watch uh, local Syrian TV every day. Yeah, Sy Syrian domestic channels are very strong. A, a range of outside uh, information sources that Brian's just mentioned, uh, and including uh, other uh, non-Arabic channels. The Russians broadcast into Syria. 
Uh, obviously, of course, our, our colleague broadcasters, the French, uh, the British, uh, the Germans are broadcasting into Syria, all have Arabic services. The Iranians. The Iranians are broadcasting, and it's a very complex, dynamic market. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, uh, the local domestic Syrian channels are still strongly watched. It's very competitive. And those are government Government run. controlled. Yeah. Thank you. And they, they capitalize uh, or appeal to the sentiment that... Syria is the victim, uh, and there actually is a fair amount of sentiment to believe that, that, uh, that the, the, the foreign influence, uh, this resonates with some percentage of the population. Okay, the um, uh, all right, That's, uh, we need to move on to questions. We really need to try to get to the agenda. Um, Governor Ash has a question. Thank you, Steve. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure we're going to get through the significant part of the agenda today. Um, Mr. Reddish, um, it's my recollection that in January you were asked by uh, David Enzer to go basically take over the PNN management. Are you still doing that or are you back up on the third floor? I am still um, the acting director for uh, the Persian News Network. Okay. Um, and you, how much longer do you anticipate that going on? Because that's been a network that at best has uh, been troubled. I'll put it that way. Um, yes, it's been troubled. We received a very um, positive, uh, along with some constructive criticism, but a positive uh, performance review just last week where um, viewership is up to about 22% of Iranians. Um, and uh, our pro programs were positively received by both um, audiences and by reviewers, um, but there still is a long way to go. Uh, to answer your question, probably within the next six to eight weeks, we should have a permanent director. All right. <clears throat> to follow up on that, because obviously it's very sensitive and, uh, and also quite important that to the degree you can get it right, I don't mean you personally, but the bo agency can get it right, uh, because as to the, the, the full-time PNN, you, you, you were there to sort of transition it during some uh, difficult personnel issues. Um, is that process underway? I mean, the bids are out, I mean, and people are applying for the position. Is that that's what's happening? I'm not asking for names or anything, just the process. The process, uh, as far as internal candidates, is nearly complete. The uh, uh, we posted the job for director internally first because of various different issues regarding the 2013 uh, budget submission. Um, there were four internal candidates who applied. Uh, the panel has interviewed all four. There's been a recommendation, and it is now before David Ensor and I, uh, David Ensor and me, to look that over. And when David gets back next, uh, next week, that will be on his agenda to interview um, the candidates that were um, recommended by the panel to go forward. So, if, and then, if and then at, and then I'm sorry. And then after after that, David and I will make a decision as to whether to select a candidate or to advertise it outside. Okay. That, that, that last part answered my question of if you were not fully satisfied with one of the internal candidates, uh, did you have the right and would you go externally? Um, I can only wish you the very best because uh, um, this agency is extremely, uh, has just been a problem, and I think it predates pre, uh, this board being in place and, and goes back many, many years uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the other questions I'm asking you are really asked because you're here representing David Enzer, but VOA questions as opposed to your uh, interim role as a PNN a director. But we heard earlier today from uh, Mr. Lobo about the uh, OPM, Office of Personnel Management Survey, uh, which he may discuss in some detail when we get to his part of the, of the, the meeting. But um, the unfortunate news, of, and I say, ask this because most of those surveys go to VOA employees with perhaps some to IVB, but that's predominantly where OPM doesn't survey uh, their grantees and they don't survey uh, 
uh, contract employees either. Uh, but last year the participation was 67%, which was pretty good. Uh, this year it dropped almost a third <coughs> down to 48%, which is not good. And uh, what, in your view, if you're aware of this, uh, accounts for in one year such a drop off? Is it uh, everyone thinks things are great, or they say, what the heck, uh, it doesn't matter if we answer the survey, nothing's going to change, uh, or, or somewhere in between? Uh, and and this just deals with the below 50% participation, and then you throw in a third of VOA or contract employees, and they're not surveyed at all. So really, the, the survey, if you combine contract and employees and full-time federal employees, comes down to about 35% of the workforce, because you've excluded a third right off the start, and then less than half are answering the ones who were surveyed. What do you see as uh, the reason for this uh, most unfortunate uh, drop-off that Governor Mulhall brought to our attention with a question he asked in the prior uh, meeting? Well, um, first of all, OPM makes the rules as far as who gets surveyed, not Voice of America or IBB. So as far as why contractors are not surveyed, I really can't answer that question. That's, that's an OPM question. As far as the participation and, and response rate is concerned, um, I will say that last year there were incentives offered for divisions that uh, um, had the largest or had a, had a certain percentage of response rate over, um, uh, over a certain percentage, and uh, there, there were incentives last year. There were no incentives this year. Um, the 48% response rate this year does represent a, uh, an increase over, it, over the response rate two years ago. Um, uh, what, there, do you, what do you mean there were there, incentives? There, there are, as well as, as, well as there are, uh, it, it, the, the survey came at a time when the 2013 fiscal budget, uh, fiscal year 2013 budget was re uh, revealed. Um, there were tremendous cuts to Voice of America in that 2013 budget, um, and I will just leave it at that. Well, let me ask, Mr. Radish, you said something that I didn't know about. What do you mean there were incentives last year? We, we were paying people to respond? or what, No, what do you we mean? were offering uh, pizza no. parties. There were pizza oh, parties okay. offered that, for, for, for high response rates for divisions and departments. Okay, so the absence of a pizza party uh, may have impacted, uh, I won't say voter. You, you, you asked, you asked for, for the various factors, and that was, that was one of the factors that um, contributed to a very high response rate last year. Okay. I think that this is going to be addressed in uh, Director Lobo's report as well. So. Well, he wouldn't know about the pizza Well, party. no, he wouldn't. No, but, he would? Okay. But yes, anyway, he would. Um, well, okay. I, I have another question, All right. uh, which is, uh, Mr. Reddish, are you there? Yes, yes. Um, one thing that I've been told by uh, AFGE, and you, you, you may very well disagree with this, and I'm not saying I agree with it, or don't agree, but I think it's uh, <clears throat> relevant, and I share this with my colleagues on the board and Mr. Enzer and, and others. I'm not sure you were on the email chain, um, but it was public, is that uh, the labor negotiations, which started in March of 2011, are still ongoing a week a month and are, according to Mrs. Cabral, going to go till December of 2012, if then, if if not, and, and beyond, conceivably, which I find, and this is on a contract that's inherent, goes back to 2005. Is there not anything that could be done to speed up the resolution of this and, uh, I mean, and, and, you know, sign a contract that's uh, at least in broad terms agreeable to both labor and management? Uh, and, and unfortunately, I'm not involved in those labor negotiations. Um, the Voice of America is not uh, specifically represented. It's a IBB issue, and I cannot personally respond uh, okay. with any knowledge of, 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 of where the negotiations stand 
or what is impeding the negotiations? I suggest we deal with this in Director Lobo's uh, report. Um, I, I think that uh, Governor Meehan, ha I'm going to violate my own rule. Governor Meehan has a, a motion he wants to offer, I believe, on, on the subject that you raised with regard to, to uh, Voice of America and RFA. Thanks. Uh, so uh, the congratulations to, uh, to VOA on the, on the news that the Burmese government's open to having a, having a Voice of America English teaching session. Um, this is a matter that, uh, that I've had great interest in, and I know Governor McHugh and Governor Ash and the whole board has been interested in Burma and the new opportunities there, the excitement of uh, opening up and relaxing some of the press or media restrictions that they've had. Uh, very excited to watch the parliamentary elections uh, in early April uh, and the results there. Uh, uh, both both uh, our RFA and VOA are excited to have Ansan Sushi as a, a guest commentator, a frequent appear on their programs. Um, for two, year, two years ago this month, most of us on this board uh, were, were confirmed uh, by, by the U.S. Senate. Um, and, and we've been working, trying to find the, the opportunities where we can move uh, forward together, um, leveraging the, the great assets of all the U.S. international broadcasting networks. And so I would like to move uh, that, the, that the board notes that this opportunity to establish a credible presence for, for all of U.S. international broadcasting in Burma uh, and the important role that both of the properties, Voice of America and Radio Free Asia, play in that market. Uh, we direct, the board directs a Voice of America director and the Re Radio Free Asia president as a condition of the BVG grant to RFA for Burmese program to work with the IBB director to coordinate the activities in and in, in for Burma, including in-country bureaus, sharing of stringer networks, uh, where appropriate sharing content. I'm also very interested as my, in my role on the Budget and Strategy Committee about a pilot project on the satellite television program that we've discussed. Um, I, I, I hope the director can, can work with both of those uh, networks to bring to the board in the July meeting a recommendation of a how to proceed to leverage that, uh, and I um, ask that also that uh, that the, the Department of State and the appropriate congressional oversight committees be keep appraised of the VOA and RFA activities in Burma. Uh, I move that the board adopts my resolution. Is there a second? There's a there isn't any discussion. Yes, uh, Mr. Mehan, should not the last sentence be modified to be a little stronger and say so, and. Uh, that uh, appropriate congressional <laughs> approval for, uh, it's not activities, but uh, an office in Burma be sought? I mean, that's what it's all about. It it's, doesn't say that. I think what's re isn't what required is, is notification, not a congressional approval? Well, then say. That's correct. Then uh, that it should be notified. I don't, I uh, mean, I guess I'm a stickler for using the precise language, but it should say should be notified of VOA and RFA. Is it offices or act is the difference between activities and an office? You, we have activities right now. Yes, and we have act we do have activities in and around Burma um, from both of the properties, and, and the Congress is aware of that as they fund that. But uh, I think what we want to make sure is that if there's new programming, which we're, we're looking for, particularly the satellite pilot, or whether it makes sense to have a physical office there well, or not. I'd I, like the staff to come back to us with that recommendation. I would say it should be kept, should be notified of if VOA and or RFA are determined to establish an office in Burma. Well, I would suggest uh, respectfully that, that I think the Congress should be notified if the board decides to put well, an office exactly. there. If the board, uh, well, exactly. Well, then so, let's raise it that way. So let's do that. So you accept that as a friendly amendment? Right. Yes. Accept that as a friendly amendment. Is there any further discussion? I, I want it read, read back. Make sure you have it. Governor, could you repeat? Um, because I, I missed it. There's a lot of back and forth. Well, the, Department, the Department of State and appropriate congressional oversight committees be notified we currently have a VOA and RFA activities in Burma. Oh, it should be, uh, thank, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if the, the BBG board determines that an office for VOA and or RFA should be established in Burma. Is that consistent with what? Do you, you get that, Paul? Okay. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? motion is agreed to. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the VOA report. 
Now Welcome. turning to the uh, RFE RL report, <coughs> Steve Korn. Thank you. Um, on May 17, last month, uh, we at RFE RL lost a member of our family. I am. Yeah. No, these mics need to be turned off. Okay. I said that on May 17th, we at RFERL lost a member of our family. Uh, our uh, colleague and reporter in Radio Mashal, Hasiba Shahib, Shahib was uh, unfortunately taken from us in an auto accident here in Prague. She was an award-winning journalist, uh, a, a, a role model to other Afghan women. She was a mother of two young children and a wife and she was merely 29 years old. Uh, yesterday, we decided that we would start and fund the <coughs> Hasiba Shahid Journalism Fellowship Program, wherein we would select every six months a um, Afghan woman journalist to work with us in Kabul and then at the very end of that six-month period here in Prague for a short time. Um, this is our way or one of the ways in which we want to uh, remember her and honor her memory and extend her legacy. And uh, we hope that many more young Afghan women are able to follow in her exemplary footsteps. I have a, a presentation here that um, has a short note about Hasiba, and then uh, you will see the last story that she ever did. Never did I imagine I would be talking about Hasiba after she's gone. I cannot imagine her death. In fact, no one can. She was so full of life. Her absence has created an emptiness everywhere. And I know workplace is not going to be the same without her. When she was fighting for life, I kept praying she would come back so that I could hug her and tell her that I love her so much. I've known Hasiba for more than two years. And all I know is that her life exemplified brilliance and hard work that needs to be lauded. She was brave and always had a smile on her face. She didn't believe in giving up. She was a visionary who was creative, innovative, and thoughtful. She was an embodiment of how good a person can be. A good friend, a good wife, a good colleague, and a mentor. She gave energy, commitment, and inspiration to all of us. She was a person of splendid character with a big heart. She would always advise me on things both in my office and personal life. In this time of bereavement, we pray that this moment of burden gets easy on us. May Allah Almighty give us and her family the courage, strength and patience to bear this loss. Dear Hasiba, you will truly be missed. We will always miss your beautiful face and wonderful smile. There's too much to say about our dearest friend Hasiba, but to be brief, I would like to conclude my tribute with the following lines from Robert Frost's poem. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. We are going to present the story of four mothers who lost their sons in the anti-terror war in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Of those four mothers, the first story is about the one who lost her son. This is about Amma Gula, a mother coming from Loyabela of the rest of Kandahar province of Afghanistan. 45 years old Amma Gula, sons fell victim to the anti-terror war. This is a really hard time and needs lots of courage. I need to take care of both his widow and children. So we are much worried about their future. It's okay so far I'm alive, but what will become of them when I'm no more? Just like Amagula, another mother across the border in Pakistan lost her son fighting the militants in the tribal areas. The young man was working with the Pakistani Frontier Constabulary. He was my son. This is his wife. He had five kids. He was innocent. This is a tragedy for us. 
we were unable to do anything. It was God's will. We didn't know what exactly happened. Later, we were told that they have been killed. The agony of those mothers was exactly the same as that of the one whose sons, according to them, were killed by Taliban. One of those mothers, who is not ready to accept her son was involved in any mischief, talked, and she says, My son was a respectable person. He was a religious man. He has never been involved in such activities. They picked him, and we came to know about his death. It was a hard time. May God save everyone from such trouble. You listen the views of those mothers whose sons got killed in fighting, and they were complaining for not getting assistance from the government. But there's another mother who lost her son, but she doesn't ask the government for help. Vicky Whetstone is an American mother whose son went to Afghanistan in 2011 as a soldier to fight the anti-terror war and later died there, she says. I personally have never understood why war is necessary. Now, my son had to learn this on his own through his own experience. Um, to me, the only thing that matters now is to end this type of madness and find other ways to resolve issues. I really believe that peace is the only way. The rest of my report is contained in my written uh, written report, which I submitted to you last week. Questions for Steve Korn? Oh, sorry. Uh, any questions for Steve Korn? Yes, I was going to ask Mr. Korn. Um, it's my understanding that Mr. Uh, James Jeffrey uh, resigned from uh, RFE and... Uh, I th did he deal with congressional relations? He was involved in, in outreach. Yes, I, I can't yes he was involved in it. And in I didn't know if there were any plans or you're just going to eliminate the position? Or, or We have no intention of fulfilling it until right. we know where we stand with consolidation. Um, it would seem to me to be uh, irresponsible at this point to fill a position that might be taken up in consolidation once the board makes its decision, we'll reevaluate our position. Well, I'm not suggesting you should or shouldn't. Uh, I do suggest that when a position like that becomes vacant, it would have been helpful if the board had been notified and not just learned it because it's a, it's a significant position, just like Susan Andrus uh, uh, leaving. That's my personal opinion. And we were not notified. Any other questions? Consolidation is, uh, this is Tara, Sun and Shine in Washington. Is consolidation a factor now in making, in people making short term decisions, in which case, what is the timetable so that employment decisions are not held up by conversations? Because I think that would mean that the board needs to deal with this issue in a timely way if indeed it's a factor in programming throughout the organization or employment. Thank you. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yes, it is a factor. We are waiting for the board to decide because we are holding certain positions open which wouldn't make sense or might not make sense in the event of consolidation. Nor would it be easy to recruit somebody into a position if they know that it might be eliminated in the short term. So I would urge the board to make a decision as soon as possible. Um, those are good points. I might suggest then by the July meeting um, we'd be prepared to vote on it. I think that would be the hope, that we might be in a position to debate and just make a final determination in July. Um, but we'll see. But okay. the points are well taken that there are issues uh, that they impact the networks, the ongoing <laughs> activities of the networks. So if I could just add, um, Particularly as it relates to the external affairs post, I know that uh, VOA recently has an opening, uh, and, and I, I appreciate uh, <laughs> Steve Korn's uh, approach. But you know, for two years ago, when we first got to the board, one of the chronic complaints were each <coughs> company went to the Capitol Hill with a different agenda, and then Governor Perino and I, and along with Governor McHugh, spent a significant amount of time trying to construct this. So. It would be U.S. International Broadcasting was represented on Capitol Hill and not five separate congressional relations, five separate communications. And so 
um, while I appreciate the service of the various people who have had their time here, I do, uh, whether consolidation moves forward or not, on, on this particular matter, this is certainly a place where we could all pull together, regardless of how the board votes, to all row in the same direction. So I look forward to, to Lynn and working through and that, that we've got the right staff and the right people to do the job we need to do. So. Can I make a comment about that? I, I wholeheartedly agree. Lynn and I have talked, um, and, and uh, the one trip I made to Capitol Hill, Lynn accompanied me on, I personally agree that there ought to be one person doing external and uh, congressional outreach on behalf of all of USIB. That was my opinion uh, before Lynn was on. Her predecessor didn't quite see it the same way. Um, and so, yeah, the, I, I completely agree with you, Mike. Any other <coughs> questions for an RFP report? Okay. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, Libby Liu, Radio Free Asia. Thank you, uh, Steve. Thank you for um, that tribute. It was a tragic loss. She was obviously a a great talent and great courage. So um, thank you for sharing that with us and uh, accept our sympathies. Thanks, Lee. Um, it's terrible. Um, the substance of RFA's work and um, accomplishments, particularly with regard to content, are contained in my written board report. Um, the visual that I brought to share with you today is focused on the video programming, um, just to show you some of the new ways that we're reaching our audience. Um, you'll see a clip taken by a Phnom Penh cameraman about Cambodian street children um, who work 10 hours a day for $2, and they are just a big source of human trafficking victims. Um, then we'll show you a one-minute clip um, from our human trafficking report about uh, a Cambodian who was sold into Thai fishery labor. And then uh, we'll show you our first ebook published. It's a cameraman's journal um, during his assignment in Burma, Cambodia, China, and Korea. Um, as you know, and thank you to Radio Free Europe for hosting on May 24th a uh, preview of our TV documentary, The Invisible World, on the topic of modern human slavery. And uh, VOA, thank you, because you will be broadcasting that on your satellite everywhere, and we very much appreciate the cooperation. And uh, finally, I want to highlight that um, if you want to, you can go to the iTunes store and download the ebook because um, we've made it downloadable for mobile device reading. So. Let me show you a video reporting. ปานนี้ขอขอน้องเรียกใจอ้อมเรียกกระดาษกระป๋องอันนั้นจวบเซ็งนี้มาตามเนี่ยมาปีเตะควักเจี๊ยบเพียบอดลอยอดกะเซ
This hub page features the video reports from Burma, Korea, China, and Cambodia, as well as individual stories and general route maps of the trek undertaken by refugees and our reporters alike. Additionally, for a behind-the-scenes look at what it took to cover this story, we include the lead cameraman's journal. The assignment was life-changing for him, and his observations are part of the story. The whole series, including the e-book, is now available for download and streaming in our <coughs> iTunes store. Thank you. <coughs> questions for thank you thank you Libby. Um, any questions for R uh, RFA? No, I, I have a question for Libby. I thought that was um, that's extraordinary. Thank you for that um, powerful reporting. On distribution, are you in touch with any um, any of the trafficking NGOs that I think would, would probably be interested in distributing it even further? Yes, and um, several NGOs were in attendance at the May 24th event, and um, there have been press stories about the event and the documentary series. That's great. Um, since Burma was mentioned in the piece, how many RFA people are in Burma reporting on stories like that? Well, um, that was a particular documentary feature that we do once a year. Um, but in Burma, at any given time, we can have five, six stringers doing um, reporting from all over the country. Um, right now, uh, two of our, um, the head of the Burmese service and her boss, the head of the Southeast Asian service, are out there um, to try to um, strategize about how we really want to approach Burma. Um, when I was there, I had uh, extensive conversations with um, the Minister of Information, which we could probably talk about in an RFA board meeting. Um, but it gave us some guidance. Thank you. Other questions for <laughs> Governor Ash? Uh, Ms. Liu. Um, Victor Ash speaking. Uh, I wanted to ask, does RFA as a corporate entity, do you all have uh, uh, requirements or regulations which if you or an employee of RFA uh, belong to a for-profit or not-for-profit board would have to disclose that under the ethics or code of ethics? And if they attended <coughs> meetings during uh, RFA time, would they have to take annual leave? What's your policy on that? Uh, we do have a policy about all outside activities, and um, they go into a conflict form, which is reviewed by um, several managers all the way up the chain, um, depending on whether they're on the programming side or the operational side. Um, generally speaking, they take time off when they work on their uh, alternate activity. Is there any exception? I mean, time off would be during a normal working day. You wouldn't have to take time off if it were Saturday or Sunday, would you? No, of course not. All right, but if during a working day you were on the board of United Way and uh, went to a three-hour board meeting or uh, or maybe you had a conference call that you participated in at the office, would that necessitate that person would take uh, annual leave off? So even as meritorious as United Way is, uh, it still is not RFA business. Um, generally, that is true, except um, under the Department of Labor laws, we don't necessarily go hour by hour for leave. So it's, it's a complicated issue, but in general, if you take a significant portion of a day, you can take a half day of vacation to um, attend a meeting. If it's well, an hour, then you probably would just work an extra hour. All right. But is there a, a threshold at which, under your procedures, it becomes, quote, a significant part of the day? Would that be in excess of two hours and in excess of three? Certainly would be if it were five or six hours. When does the okay, threshold kick in? It's generally about a uh, half day. You know, so if it's day. like three, three to four hours, we would consider that a half day right. and you would probably take a half day off. If one belonged to a for-profit corporate board, uh, he or she, while it's permissible, would certainly, would they have to take time off? Um, yes, of course, but... Meeting. But that's, a, of course, predicated on um, whether or not the conflicts committee has cleared that event, you know, that activity. Well, assuming there's no conflict, 
and you belong to such a board, would would you have to take annual leave if you, you know, spent Wednesday attending such a meeting? Yes. Is is that a yes or no? Oh, it's yes. I'm sorry, I'm far away from the microphone. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, any, anything else for uh, Libby Lou? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Middle East Broadcasting Networks. Brian Conniff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just uh, mention a few highlights on events that have happened over the last month uh, relating to the dynamic uh, situation in the Middle East. Um, Egypt has been uh, front and center. Uh, we've treated Egypt as a local story and as a pan-Arab story. The Middle East is watching everything that's happening there uh, to see whether they can successfully uh, take the transition to democracy. And also the Mubarak trial has been uh, watched closely as uh, an indication of whether accountability uh, can actually be achieved. Uh, to accomplish our coverage of these events, we uh, entered into a co-production partnership with a popular Egyptian channel, Al Hayat. Uh, as part of that process, we um, conducted a series of high-profile interviews with the presidential candidates. This was in the first round. Uh, and it was um, attended by uh, other uh, members of Egyptian uh, political life uh, questioning the candidates, uh, something that uh, hadn't been done before. Obviously, they hadn't had real presidential elections. Um, and it afforded us the opportunity to enter into the homes of millions of uh, uh, Egyptians that we had never been able to uh, enter before. We had a commentator uh, as well as our logo uh, prominently displayed on the set. So we were quite uh, quite happy about that. Uh, we have a continuing uh, arrangement with the station to do the two finalists uh, for the presidential election now scheduled for June 16th and 17th. Um, for the coverage of the actual election, we also uh, approached it as a local as well as a pan-Arab channel. We had correspondence, uh, both al Hara and Sawa, uh, correspondence um, in large cities throughout Egypt and in small towns, uh, polling booths, uh, taxi drivers, um, uh, men on the street uh, type interviews. Uh, so we provided uh, coverage for the actual election day itself uh, as if we were a local channel. But in addition, uh, in the days leading up to the event, as well as the days afterwards, we provided uh, uh, expert analysis on talk shows uh, similar to um, uh, Free Hour and Huwara Cairo. Uh, and also Radio Sawa expanded its news coverage from its uh, shorter five-minute news breaks to 30-minute news breaks uh, for the day of the actual election and the uh, the day after. So uh, that continues to be a major part of our coverage, and obviously we'll do a similar uh, comprehensive um, course, uh, coverage during the uh, the finalists scheduled for, for mid-June. Um, also, uh, in, uh, in early May, we broadcast the fourth episode of the five-part series on the Arab Spring that we're uh, in partnership with, with the McNeil Lear Production House. This episode was on uh, Syria, which was a much more challenging episode to produce, but we think added value to the, uh, to the environment. Uh, and then in, uh, in closing in May, we uh, finally launched the new and improved websites for both Al Hura and Radio Sawa. Uh, these websites are supported by Pangea, and uh, we think it will provide uh, uh, a user-friendly or a, a journalist-friendly, I should say, way of uh, providing news and information, updating the website, and also providing for interaction, which is obviously the direction we want to go. We want to take... Uh, take uh, the website beyond just being a passive uh, venue to, to something being uh, interactive with our uh, audience, and this is something that Pangea will be um, helpful in. So, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Any questions? Did you have a video or anything? Are you, uh, uh, no. Tara, uh, Undersecretary Sonnenschein. Um, you mentioned twice the difference between local a local story and a pan-Arab story. And from my own reference, do all the entities distinguish between local, regional, global coverage, both in terms of 
resource capability decisions and purpose or objective, or is every entity capable of and desirous of doing local coverage and the wider angle, or do we separate those out? Um, so. Yeah, I, I let my colleagues speak for themselves, but part of our, it's the judgment calls we have to make every day, and that is um, if you go too local into a Lebanese political story, you're going to um, discourage the rest of the region from watching it. So you have to make calls about what is local but also has pan-Arab, in our case, interest. And those are tough calls. We don't want to be uh, perceived as, um, as a local channel in any one of these specific marketplaces. There are a lot of local channels in all these countries. We don't want to really <coughs> compete with them. So we're always trying to find this balance of a story that is in a, in a, in a particular country but also has appeal and has themes that uh, appeal across the region. And that's the judgment call we go through every day in making those decisions. And the same viewer may want both. Yes, exactly. And they usually do watch both. Uh, as somebody in, in America would watch their local news at 6 o'clock, they're going to watch the network at 7. Uh, we, we assume that that's the judgment that most viewers will go through. So we're looking at the, the network uh, angle, but with those kinds of stories that somebody would be interested in Morocco about what's going on in Egypt. Understood. And we're, we're pretty much the opposite. We do <laughs> want to be perceived as um, a local station for the market that we're um, going towards. Uh, to the extent that we do um, coverage of regional or international activities, it's like a segue into how that impacts you, you in Cambodia. So um, it's very different because he has one language that has multiple markets, and we have one language for one market. So thank you. Any questions? Uh, this question. is Carlos. This is oh, wait a minute. Governor McHugh first, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Quick question, Brian. Thank you for your report on the new websites. Yes. I'm curious about what kind of interactivity you're engaging in or that you anticipate. Well, right now it's it's um, questions, polls, um, particularly with the all events going in Egypt. Uh, you know, the basic questions: Which candidate do you like? What do you think will happen if the Islamists win? I mean, that's sort of standard interaction. We do see uh, eventually putting blogs up. In fact, this week we're having training with. Uh, with our journalist about how to uh, do blogs because um, there's a lot of journalistic ethics uh, questions uh, that come up. Um, so uh, it's it's still um, what you would normally expect. It, it doesn't have anything uh, much beyond that. We're working with Rob Bowles though uh, with some of our programs about sort of the behind the scenes, you know, the groom, green room, green room um, discussions before and after. <laughs> We've done some of that, but uh, it's sort of uh, pilot projects right now. Maybe in July or in the fall we can get a report on how it's working. Okay, that's, that'd be good. We'll look forward to that. Um, Carlos, you had a question? No, I was just want to answer the undersecretary's question. We're pretty much like like Libby's. We try to be local, then we bounce off the news to... Um, try to uh, pr get content from the Americas, the United States, Latin America, and the rest of the world. But that, I just want to clarify that to answer our question. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Governor Ash. Um, Mr. Karloff? Yes. Uh, I was going to ask you uh, similar questions to what I asked Mrs. Liu uh, at MBN. If uh, you or any employee of MBN belong to a for-profit corporate board or a non-profit 501c3 board, uh, one, is that permitted? And would it have to be, dis and two, disclosed uh, to uh, MBN? Uh, yeah, we have a very similar policy. In fact, I think all of the grantees' uh, conflict of interest policies were written or coordinated, so I th they probably all read about the same. Uh, if an employee has any outside uh, interest, uh, be it nonprofit or profit, they're required to disclose that. Um, and it's, it's uh, what, what you would normally expect. Uh, in, in addition, uh, our time and attendance system requires an employee, if they're absent from work, 
to report e it either as, um, well, in a variety of different categories, but that they're required to account for their, their day. So if they were taking time off to, to do something that wasn't MBN related, they would be required to take some form of leave. And that would be true if it was conducted from the office for a certain amount of time? That is, you participate on, say, a conference call uh, from the office and and obviously weren't doing yeah, MBN work, I mean, but the you report, were spent a couple the hours. Policy, uh, the policy doesn't get that specific, but I would probably uh, say that what, what uh, Libby said would be acceptable, and that is if you uh, spent an hour on that and uh, you wanted to uh, uh, work another hour that later that night, uh, that that would all be fine. It's, you know, we're not accounting for it that precisely. But, uh, yeah, in general, the idea is to indicate what you did during that work day. Okay, any other questions for uh, Brian Conniff at MBN? Thank you very just much, Brian. I, um, uh, just one from here. I think both Governor McHugh and I are wondering if the line of questioning is something that the whole Board of Governors should know what is leading to the question so that we're not... Perhaps uh, yeah. Governor Ash might Governor answer Ash the question. That Yes, was, yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. I was just wondering, Governor Ash, if there's something in particular that's occurring that we need to be aware of. Well, when I secure all the information I need to secure, I will certainly share it with you. But yes, I'm, I mean, there's a reason. I'm not just doing it to take up time. I'm, uh, um, there have been uh, comments made to me that uh, I think bear further exploration and asking the questions uh, is one way of me uh, finding out if the comments uh, have validity to them. Well, I would also say that we have a, we've announced that the Governance Committee will take up the issue of, of these, these issues of, of um, involvement on nonprofit boards and, and reporting of the time associated with that and other external activities. And I believe that's the appropriate approach for that. So thank well, you. The reason I did it now is since the next Governance Committee meeting is an unknown date and maybe at least six or seven weeks from now, uh, I think I wanted to secure at least some preliminary answers before then and not wait that long. Um, I, Michael Linton, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Okay, fine. We're going to move now into some business items. And the first item on this on this business business item relates to uh, a, a proposed protocol for the protection of confidential information. And by way of background, uh, I would like to read, make the following statement. Uh, at the request of several governors, I would like to introduce a resolution to establish some ground rules and policy among the governors regarding disclosure of non-public and pre-decisional information. These ground rules are important to protect the integrity of the board's deliberative process. The Broadcasting Board of Governors operates under a number of important legal constraints that require the board to establish a significant level of transparency and public access to board proceedings, including the Government in the Sunshine Act and the Freedom of Information Act. The current board has opened its proceedings in a far greater manner than any previous board. We hold open meetings. The agency's FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, compliance has substantially improved over the last few years. More documents are posted on the BBG website for public review than at any time in the past. To be clear, in establishing or proposing to establish ground rules among governors regarding disclosure of public and pre-decisional information, no other governor intends to retreat to a position of public inaccessibility or to reverse the steps we have taken as a board. In other words, we intend to be as open, as transparent as law and prudent policy allow. The fact is, however, that the agency, the board, and each individual governor have legitimate institutional interests showing agency management outside advisors and individual governors to brief the board and have the board consider and discuss information without fear that information will be leaked without the board's knowledge or authorization. The need to protect the integrity of the deliberative process in which the leadership of an executive branch agency engages in discharging constitutional and statutory duties is well recognized in law and practice. The United States Supreme Court has recognized, quote, the valid need for protection of communications between government officials and those who advise and assist them in the performance of their manifold duties. And further stated, quote, 
The importance of this confidentiality is too plain to require further discussion. Human experience teaches that those who expect public dissemination of the remarks may well temper candor with a concern for appearances and for their own interest to the detriment of the decision-making process. Further, in a separate opinion, the Supreme Court also recognized that disclosing, quote, the communications and the ingredients of the decision-making process, unquote, might inevitably, quote, injure the quality of agency decisions by inhibiting frank discussion of legal or policy matters, unquote. President Obama has directed all federal agencies, including the BBG, to increase, increase transparency. But even the administration's open government directive makes provision for protection of confidentiality. According to the, to the administration's 2009 open government directive, quote, nothing in this directive shall be construed to suggest that the presumption of openness precludes the legitimate protection of information whose release would threaten national security, invade personal privacy, breach confidentiality, or damage other genuinely compelling interests, unquote. Recently, the Office of the Inspector General of the National Labor Relations Board found that the unauthorized disclosure of non-public information constitutes a violation of federal ethics laws. The ground rules that we are proposing that the Board should adopt are set forth in the one-page resolution which has been distributed to the Board. The resolution defines deliberative information that should not be disclosed without the Board's authorization. This simple policy, by its terms, will be interpreted in a manner consistent with the Board's obligations under the Government and the Sunshine Act. The ground rules proposed in the resolution are based on best federal practices in light of the experience of other agencies that are also subject to the Government and the Sunshine Act. So with that, I'd invite questions or comments on the proposal of the proposed policy. Well, isn't the attorney who drafted it not going to explain what's in it? Well, I think if you want to we, ask I mean, questions. We've only had it for 10 hours. You have a question? I mean, the question is, you, would you explain what's in it? I would think the board, you would want to know that. You can't tell me what's in it. You couldn't tell me two hours ago. Well, I, uh, I'm comfortable with the policy as it's written. Well, you're comfortable with something you can't explain, which is good. Well, I don't. I admire your comfort level. Well, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much, um, Governors. Well, uh, what, what this policy would be doing, for those of the Governors, uh, this is the at attachment one to the draft record of decisions. Uh, but what it basically does is... speak into the mic? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, what it basically does is define a, a category of information called deliberative, which is a defined term deliberative information, which means non-public information uh, that's exchanged between two or more Governors or between agency staff members and, and uh, Governors uh, which is pre-decisional and deliberative, meaning that it's the subject of the board's consideration prior to the announcement of a final board decision. Um, the definition of deliberative information specifically excludes factual information that is otherwise publicly available, um, and it excludes individual governors' own opinions that do not reflect the board's deliberative process. Those are not part of deliberative information. Um, Yes, it does. In the definition of deliberative information, which is in the second full paragraph of the definition. Uh, now, with respect to this category of information, of, uh, of deliberative information, uh, the policy would establish that each uh, member of the board is obligated not to disclose certain aspects of that information, the substance of, of deliberative information or the status of discussions about it. Uh, the positions of other governors regarding the deliberative information or their individual comments about it. Uh, documents prepared to provide the board with deliberative information or to memorialize any aspect of the deliberative information or any subsection or part of those documents, as well as the identity of governors or staff members who provide deliberative information or prepare <coughs> deliberative information for the board. Um, and then uh, the, um, uh, the policy goes on to say that the obligation not to disclose that, that kind of information continues after the decision is publicly announced and that such information will remain protected until the board authorizes the release of the information. Um, it, it says it recommends that the deliberative information should be released after consultation with the agency's Office of General Counsel regarding the implications of waiving the deliberative process privilege um, and upon an official board resolution providing authority to do so. Uh, and finally, the uh, 
briefly the, the policy uh, notes that disclosure of deliberative information is a serious matter and constitutes mis, uh, mismanagement and misconduct. Uh, it also notes, uh, as, um, uh, as was noted in the recent uh, National Labor Relations uh, Board decision, uh, Office of Inspector General decision that Governor Mulhoff spoke to, uh, that uh, unauthorized disclosure of official non-public information is prohibited by federal ethics rules. And finally, uh, this, this policy by its terms makes clear that the policy does not affect the agency's requirements to comply with the Government in the Sunshine Act and will be implemented in a manner consistent with the provisions of the Government in the Sunshine Act. All right, um, Mr. Comer, just so I can understand, it's very clear that uh, by this uh, protocol you're saying that the full board would need to vote to, in effect, declassify or open up uh, particular documents. Is that correct? If, if it were deliberative information, right. then the board would, would have to uh, waive the, right. the embargo, basically. Right. Or, or so that's to release it. Yes. My question is, does the full board or a member of the board need to approve it being labeled deliberative or uh, pre-decisional, to use your word? Or is that something a staff member does, but only the board? The board has no role in determining what is predecisional or right. well, done. I, I don't see that in here. Well, you, you take care of the last part, but you don't seem to take care of the front end part. Well, well that's uh, thanks, uh, Governor Ash. Actually, that's the purpose of this memo. Is uh, the purpose of this policy is to define a category of information, which by its terms it, it becomes subject to this, to this non-disclosure obligation. Um, the board is now making, the, if it adopts this policy, is making the decision that this category of information becomes protected. So that's that's what you that's what you would be doing well, if you were to vote for it. At the risk of having a running debate, and I'm not going to engage in a running debate, I'll make a, a statement at the end. Um, what you're saying is a little bit like beauty. It's in the eyes of the beholder, and your definition may be clear to you. It may not be clear to the person sitting next to you or to someone else. And people have major debates, and that's why you have lawsuits as to what uh, uh, is, is what. And, um, you know, I, I noticed that, for example, you know, we have people going to the Hill advocating the CEO position and certain uh, what it should contain. It's labeled pre-decisional. But if a governor goes, uh, he's in violation of confidential rule or releases it. I don't understand that. Okay. Why yeah, that? That's so, I was asking yeah, Governor Meehan well, to speak to this. Well, just, just a Please. point of clarification. Yeah. If, if, I, if I've understood this right, is that that this this policy that that's being proposed would allow a classification. And if you think beauty is X and I think it's Y, uh, it allows for the board to have a vote to say whether X or Y carries the day. And, if I've understood if this that's right, what, if, if that's I've what it is, correctly. I agree with you, but that's not what it says. If it was specific that they would have to decide on that prior to it going out and everyone had a vote in it, I, I, I commend you. But what, where I have a problem is, is just as you became upset, rightly so, about Mr. Enzer announcing an office in Burma without board's approval, according to this, someone's going to, on staff, I assume, or my good friend, the esteemed Mr. Lobo, who is not a member of the board, but a valued consultant and friend, will label this pre-decisional or confidential or not for distribution. And no member of the board voted on it or had anything to do with it. But to get it to be open and no longer pre-decisional, the board has to meet to declassify it. Uh, I mean, that seems to be where we're headed. But if I'm wrong, I'd like to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you if you were to read, uh, say Freedom of Information Act uh, and their precedents, or uh, language in the laws that that protect classified information, or language in the laws and regulations that pr protect uh, proprietary, uh, non-public commercial information, you would find the, exactly the same types of categories, exactly the same types of definitional categories that you, that you have here. In other words, uh, to a certain extent, yes, you have to decide that information fits within a particular category. But I don't think if we read this, I, I don't think that that is 
really that difficult. But on a case, it's, it's non-public information, either a tangible record or otherwise, exchanged between two or more governors or between agency staff members and the governors. It's pre-decisional and it's deliberative, meaning that it's the subject of the board's consideration prior to the announcement of a final board decision. That's I, I, that's that's not a particularly opaque or difficult to understand. At least you know it might might guidance be required in particular cases. Probably not different from FOIA, not different from laws on classification, not different from laws regarding the protection of commercial well, non-public proprietary information. Um, first of all, I'm the only member of this board who's an attorney, has a law license. Uh, secondly. Um, Attorneys differ. That's why they get on different sides of the lawsuit, and they, reasonable people can arrive at different conclusions. And certainly on this issue, we have. Um, I'm well aware, and I'm uh, that this will pass uh, and it'll be adopted. But I think it's important here in a public meeting that whoever's listening should know this. At least I, as one member of the board did not have a copy of this final document until you emailed it to me last night. There has been no committee consideration. And the question that I'm asking, you haven't provided the Freedom of Information Act and the documents where we could read it together and decide whether I agree with your verbal explanation of it or don't. And any lawyer worth his law degree will look at the written document as well as the verbal explanation of the document. Uh, and no committee of this board has done that. The board is just apparently determined you're going to pass it and, and be done with it, and hopefully that will put it to bed. If life were only that simple, that would be fine. Life's not that simple. And, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your remarks today. Uh, and I, I'm sure you're sincere in hoping that this will resolve this matter. I think is uh, that this represents a giant step backwards. And let me just say, where I'm coming from and why I feel the way I feel. In fact, I had a conversation with Mrs. Weil a, a few weeks ago when I think she was sort of shocked, not because she disagreed, but just was shocked uh, of the environment in which I grew up as an adult in the state of Tennessee. I authored Tennessee, along with others, in a bipartisan way, Tennessee's Open Records Act. I authored Tennessee's um, uh, Open Meetings Act, which are different. The Open Records Act in many states is far stronger than the Federal Freedom of Information Act ever dreamed of being. Now, certainly in the federal level, when it's national security issues there are very, and military issues, there are obvious reasons for exemptions. I don't think that applies here, except perhaps in a few isolated cases. Uh, but when I was mayor of Knoxville, and it happened, if someone wanted to walk into my office and ask to review the top shelf on the, uh, the top drawer in the file cabinet, as long as we had somebody there with them, make sure they didn't take it, uh, they were entitled to see it. No questions asked. There's no, no, this word pre-decisional didn't exist. Um, I, uh, two members of my city council could not meet uh, without um, people being there. The search committee for the new press of the University of Tennessee which has gone on for five or six years, has had to meet in public because that's what the open record. Is that why it's gone on for five or six years? Is that what? I was asking if that's why the search has gone on for five or six years. Well, actually, uh, it hadn't gone on for five or six years. There have been different searches. and uh, But uh, like many universities, some work out and some don't. I don't think it can be. Uh, I was I was kidding. Uh, I'm sure you were. And, and this is a serious issue. I simply say that because I'm used to operating in that environment, and it doesn't upset me. Uh, and I think a lot of this effort here today is more of convenience than it is of of necessity. I know you're not, and you will, we'll have a chance for you to come back. But I think it's I've had a couple of people email me to say that they'd like to speak too. So I mean, I'm happy to recognize well, you some more. Uh, do you want me to speak after? As long as I don't relinquish my right to speak. No, of course you you will. But I think, would it be okay if we heard from some other you people? You mean other governors? Other governors. Sure. I'd be um, to, I, mean, I haven't, you know. I, first of all, I. Uh, Whichever governors want to speak, and I'll yield to them. Who would like to start? Maybe no one does. Well, no. Uh, Michael Linton, I know you want to say something. Yeah, I'm happy to 
to speak. I mean, Victor, I hear everything you're saying, and I don't disagree with, with, with what you're describing. In well, I think, though, that we've had a history um, on the board of some serious problems with leaks uh, to the press, which suggests not an, not an issue of openness, but rather uh, an active outreach to the press, which is not necessarily condoned by the rest of the board. And I think this, this resolution does, for more than anything else, makes an effort to stop that. I think, I think in general it makes most of the governors uncomfortable that, um, that there is an active outreach to the press about certain discussions which, you know, may or may not be on the public record. And so I don't think we're trying to close anything down. I think we're just trying to prevent that from happening. And, I, I, you know, I, I know that other organizations inside the government have similar confidentiality agreements, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, w I was speaking for myself. I remember a, a meeting that we had, um, maybe last meeting, where and Under Secretary Sonnenstein can speak for herself, but she said that that the State Department was very reluctant to share information with us, given the situation that we find ourselves in, that the information gets leaked. Uh, Tara, do you am I characterizing what you said appropriately? I, I was reflecting the the sort of self censorship mode that we need to go in if you're bringing foreign policy. Um, <coughs> material to the board um, in a private session, there's a reason why you would say it privately but not publicly if it's a classification. Every day we face classification issues on what we should share, but I consider the private board deliberations as a place, a safe place, to talk about information with my colleagues that I might not be as specific about in a public session. So. That is a sensitivity, but if people feel it's going to be all public, then you would re restrict what you feel comfortable talking about in terms of the foreign policy issues that factor into some of the decision making. So I was reflecting some of the reluctance or chilling effect that you have if you're nervous that you're going to say something that is then for everybody to comment on on a blog the next day. That is a, a very difficult position, I think, for any representative for, from state. Michael? Amin? You want to comment on that? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know that you'll want me to do a running debate and comment on every single one. I'll wrap it up towards the end. I'm not trying to belong, but I think there are a number of things I want to say. Sure. So well, I'll just speak for myself. I, I, I feel that, um, you know, I've worked in Washington for 27 years, and there's a long time. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen inside of government that that uh, should be transparent, and I, 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 will, I will back a transparent effort. And, w and what my experience on this board has had moments where I can't believe the inaccurate things that have been ascribed to what I've said. So there's nobody more concerned about what you're asked, to, what your positions are. I don't mind taking criticism for my positions when someone disagrees with me, but I sure do mind when I have my positions uh, mischaracterized uh, as some sort of credible source. So I, I share everyone's frustration. Um, I think this is a u weird, unique thing, this board, where special government employees, whatever that means, um, if, if somebody in my company or somebody in any office that I worked in when I was in government was found to do any of this, you could fire them. You can't get fired from this board. So we have to have this self-policing mechanism, as far as I can tell. We've tried to find a way to deal with this. But what I find is it's a reasonable approach because if there's a pre-decisional document and the default position is pre-decisional document, which is clearly outlined by the administration of what it takes to do that, this board could vote to overturn the decision of a staffer who put it in pre-decisional, and then we could put it in the light of day up in an open meeting. So there's a vehicle to deal with these things that you refer to from your past, uh, past work on making things more open and transparent as a way to do that. And then that'll give us all a chance to talk about whether we think it's appropriate to move some of these things along. But for, for me, what I'm frustrated by is in every other government place that I've worked in, 
you can be fired for what happens here. You can be found out to do this, and you can be fired. As a member of the board, you can't be fired. You can only be asked by the president to leave. And so this is an attempt to, to strike a balance for transparency, but also to be in a place where you can speak your mind. We don't have a lot of time here. We all have private sector lives, and this is, just happens to be a thing that we do as part of our extended public service. I don't, you know, we've had to cancel committee meetings because nobody wants to read about uh, mischaracterizations of their opinions. That's not a fun place to work. And I think if you talk to a couple of our former board members in their heart of hearts, they'll talk about that that's one of the reasons why they're not here anymore, is because it's a frustrating place to actually have your point of opinion that, that, that is clearly in a space that should be held private. This is a news agency. This is a news organization. Everybody here believes in putting the news out front. But, but you can't have an honest conversation that I might ultimately vote the other way if my first statement is going to be voted the opposite side. So um, we accept as part of, you know, no one makes you stay as a governor. Uh, no one makes you stay working for the government. But the government has rules that you can't put national security stuff on the front page of the VOA website. There's a law against that. And there should be. There should be certain things that fall into this category. And, and all we're saying is there are some documents, pre-decisional, that should fall into this category. And there are some documents that should be open. And ultimately later, some of these documents that we use to make the decision do become public. We do get to read about stuff that happens. Should, so, I, should I jump in? Yeah, yes, go ahead. Uh, Governor McHugh. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. It, it, or, um, Governor Meehan, that was well put. I think um, as an agency, we have and we need to strive for transparency, which is what we've done. We are about the free flow of information. But at the same time, to Governor Meehan's point, what we, are, what we need to avoid is the misrepresentation of information. And that happens when partial information may or may not be intentionally leaked um, to perhaps impact an outcome. And, you know, we need as a board to have the free flow of information amongst us. So um, perhaps through this policy, we will we'll get there. But I would see this in keeping with our goal of ensuring that what we put out is the most accurate information available to our audiences and to those who uh, share our mission. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the attempt is to have a reasonable balance. And I also would say that if we find that this is not, if it's being too onerous or it's Struck, struck the balance in the wrong way, I am more than happy to have it come back to the governance committee or to the full board to be adjusted. That's entirely fine. But this, I think, we're hearing that this was a pretty strong opinion from a large majority of the board about, um, about things that, that are, are misrepresenting or that are personal attacks or whatever. Um, and. That, that's where we're coming from. So the statement I made was on behalf of at least most of the colleagues that have spoken today and others that are not here. Um, so, and it's not meant to be draconian. It's just, it's in line with best practice in federal, it's in other federal agencies, it's consistent with what's being done in federal agencies. And um, if we find it's gone too far, the only, I'll be the first one along with most everyone else to try to adjust it. Um, to make sure that we are, in fact, open. So over to you, Governor Ash. Um, Mr. Chairman, first of all, uh, thank you for those comments. Um, it was mentioned you, one person served on the Hill 27 years. Um, I served in elected public office for 31 years, six as a state representative, nine as a state senator, and 16 years as mayor of the city of Knoxville. And I lived under Tennessee's open records law all but two of those years because the law hadn't been passed in 1968 uh, or it was a modified law. Uh, so I'm used to dealing with it, and that's just part of my DNA. That's where it comes from. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not retreated, nor do I plan to, uh, on this. Um, I'm somewhat intrigued that you say, of course, the Governor's Committee can now meet and come back and correct any problems, but you've never called a meeting to discuss this in the first place. Uh, the fact is, it was on the agenda for the last governance committee, which was postponed. And then the governor, any governor, can ask that something be removed from a committee and brought to the full board, where the board oh. acts as a committee of the whole. Well, it can be sent back to the governance committee as well, if that's the board's choice. Well, the fact is, you've given your answer and you're sticking to it, and I understand that. But the record will reflect, unlike most resolutions that come here, this did not go to governance. It wasn't fully vetted. It wasn't even remotely vetted. In fact, I beg to differ with you. I don't think it was on the last agenda for May 24. I don't remember seeing it. But if I'm wrong about that, that's, that's a minor 
point, and I, I step back and withdraw it. But uh, in terms of this meeting, it was never on this board's agenda for today until, uh, in fact, didn't even go out until Juan Cron sent out the email <coughs> and closed the document last Thursday on May 31. I, no one saw it. Well, I didn't see it. I'll put it that way. Others may have seen it since obviously the others have been talking to each other and kind of know what they want to do. Uh, but secondly, uh, I, I think it, the record should reflect that as opposed to uh, soliciting and pointing out some of the issues that exist, uh, it just was turned over to the attorney. Um, and frankly, I think there are a couple of issues here that have to be looked at. The first hurdle in this item is the First Amendment. Um, when, when you're acting as a, a member of this board, you are also a federal employee for the brief time you're serving here. At least we're paid for that. And the courts have consistently recognized the rights of federal employees to speak openly on matters which may be of public concern. Uh, and I think uh, this particular policy can circumvent and weaken uh, that obligation. Secondly, and it's been utterly unmentioned here today, but if in the course of deliberations, and I would hope what I'm about to say would never occur, but it could, and there's not even mentioned, <clears throat> if there were whistleblower protections discussing potential problems or matters of concern within the agency or how the agency should be run or protected activities. That is, if one came across information, I have a chance meeting with Governor Meehan and I rode on the same plane and had a very enjoyable conversation and didn't discuss business uh, on loose topics. But that's a chance meeting, which I assume is covered with two governors. Um, and if I learned something, I never would from Mr. Meehan, so that, that was uh, illegal or immoral. You would I, never I, learn something from me? Well, I would learn, but I wouldn't learn something that was illegal. I learned daily being in your shadow. Uh, but uh, I can assure you um, there should be an exemption spelled out for this doesn't infringe upon or even remotely infringe upon whistleblowers. And that's not even mentioned. Now, you can say, well, that's the law, and of course we all understand, and that's the case. But it's not here. Uh, also, there are really no standards in this proposed policy. I mean, I think a court would end up throwing this out because it's too broad to give reasonable guidance as to what you're supposed to do. One of the issues with laws against pornography, which I support, by the way, uh, is that they were so broad that the courts could not know it. Only until Potter Stewart came along and said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, uh, did, did that sort of amorphous standard develop. And I'm just saying here, if you look at it, surely not all information that a staff member says is confidential and pre-decisional is automatically that, and no review, and no review by a single member of the board. But then you say the board can, by resolution, uh, uh, rescind that, but we know the board meets every five to six weeks, and by that time it's been forgotten or or whatever is, uh, has occurred. There's no statement in here. Who decides what is confidential? No one that we're saying here, and this is why the governance committee should have been meeting. All these could hopefully be spelled out, and you're going to be back here again at some point, either with this board or future board, dealing with everything here, you talk about mismanagement or misconduct. Who determines what is mismanagement? Is this board going to meet as a review board and, and uh, a member of the board uh, uh, violated this policy and then they're going to, what, pass a resolution saying that's a no-no, send it to the U.S. attorney and ask him to investigate and prosecute? I mean, what what is planned? Uh, and why are these terms not defined? I mean, you know, the holes in this policy are bigger and, uh, are big enough for a Mack truck to drive through. I mean, what if a member of Congress, and we all, most of us, have friends who are members of Congress whose friendship we value, a number of whom we know know about this board, staffers. If they ask me, what about the CEO proposal that Lynn Wiles sent out a, uh, at Dick Lobo's suggestion or direction uh, about the CEO that originally was going to include the entities and not include the entities, I'm supposed to say, well, Senator, uh, that's pre-decisional and I can't respond. Is that my answer? I don't think so. Uh, not to someone that I, I grew up with and we were fellow staff aides uh, on Senator Howard Baker's staff 42 years ago. Uh, 
you know, I, I think you, you, you've gone far more than surely you intended. I would think any member of this board. <laughs> we lost you. Are they good? Are these folks against me? <laughs> if I were conspiracy, blame the conspiracy theory, I'd say it was planned. Well, I think it's We're back. We're back. Right, let me continue. <laughs> I've got um, this musical in <laughs> In other words, am I prohibited from discussing with a senator or uh, a, a senior staff aide on House appropriations or Senate appropriations? Uh, this, am I prohibited from talking to a fellow attorney? Is the only attorney I can talk to the legal deputy legal counsel here with whom I may have an honest and professional disagreement, but we just aren't on the same wavelength? Um, well, I can, I, uh, no, if I can, I'm if, not if I can interject. Okay, Governor McHugh. It just because it seems to me, I think that the goal of this policy is to allow for the governors and staff to have pre-decisional conversations and not have those conversations intentionally or not misrepresented to the to the press, uh, and not to have inaccurate information or partial information get out that's misleading. That seems to be our goal here, not to suppress any information. Uh, I'm not for that at all, Governor Ash. I agree with you on those points. So um, maybe if we can focus on what the goal of this is, which, do, well, which is, like I said, go Governor ahead. McHugh, no one respects or uh, likes you more than I do. Uh, and we may differ, but, but that doesn't diminish uh, the relationship that we have and, uh, and my friendship for you. But this does far more than, than your stated statement, in my opinion. There are others who might disagree with me, but it goes far beyond that. And I think we'll be back here uh, in that. Let me just quickly sort of finish up because uh, I, I know everyone's anxious to go do something else. Uh, but in terms of information, uh, I think Justice Lewis Brandeis probably explained it well. And this comes from The Economist, uh, May 26 to June 1 issue, uh, where they discussed the president's uh, uh, transparency and the headline is the best disinfectant uh, and it gives the president good marks on uh, uh, supporting transparency but also uh, uh, feels that he has not gotten good remarks on protecting whistleblowers uh, in the column and um, but this comes at a time when uh, I would point out whistleblowers in the year 2010 77 percent of the 3.1 billion dollars that America won in fraud-related judgments and settlements came from suits brought by whistleblowers. That could be either in the private or public sector. So I think whistleblowers, as uncomfortable and as unpleasant as it may be for the people having the whistle blown on them, is an important part of American society and is protected by federal law. But nowhere in this do we reference that and even salute and nod our hat and saying, yes, protecting whistleblowers is something we don't mean to even remotely infringe upon, and this doesn't even do that. But let me conclude by saying <coughs> sunlight, this is Justice Lewis Brandeis from Massachusetts, a Supreme Court justice nearly a century ago, is said to be the best of disinfectants. That is, unless it's national security, letting the sun shine in, uh, I think is important and is, and you know, when we're talking about how a piece of legislation on the CEO is drafted, I don't consider that foreign policy. I consider that institutional policy as to what would be best, and there's no reason since it involves, and this board is not a private board. This isn't the Columbus Club. This isn't a, a private board like Brown Shoe Company. This is a public body of members uh, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, uh, and should be considered uh, that way. Uh, I think, you know, oftentimes, for example, uh, the way, and, and I fondly disagreed with this, and this is one reason I think that uh, this is a mistake, uh, is that this board has not had a serious debate, in my view, and there are members here who disagree with me, on what the CEO position should be. <coughs> and whether or not we should go forward with it. 
an email was sent out directed by Mr. Lobo uh, doing a, uh, a straw poll on whether the majority of the board wanted to proceed with it or not proceed. There's no doubt in my mind the majority supported proceeding. I was one who did not. I thought, frankly, the straw poll, and again, my personal opinion, was in effect a notational vote under another name, that it was camouflaged uh, cleverly, uh, but also inappropriately. And that there, and, and while the board could have met and arrived at the same decision, there at least would have been a discussion and a dialogue, just as we're having right now. I mean, I'm under no illusions what the final vote's going to be, but we have spent about 40 minutes now discussing what we think the pros and cons of this protocol are. Uh, and I think that's, thank goodness, we are doing that. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's important, but I think, you know, I have a higher responsibility to inform members of Congress uh, of concerns that I might have when I disagree with proposed policy. And I don't feel I have to wait until this board has decided to say, now you can, it's free to talk about, and it may be after the fact. I think the, the process of the consideration of the House and Senate committees and when we have staff that will go up there uh, to represent a majority view of the board, uh, that also all the documents ought to be able to go uh, with them. And I think that uh, is not being done here, and, and, this, and that represents a, a step back. Um, I can assure you that uh, when this uh, motion is adopted, um, I will follow my conscience in terms of what uh, should be done. And, um, and I just let everyone know I don't want anyone to be misled uh, as to um, my attitude on it because it's a, it's a matter of, of deep principle with me uh, that, uh, that staff should not be able to just take the stamp out and put classified, confidential, pre-decisional, and no member of this board. Now, if the board voted to make something confidential, I have a different attitude towards it. Uh, but when, in effect, we are delegating non-delegable authorities, and because our attorney says you'll do it, but, you know, uh, that doesn't mean you can do it. It's just what he said. Um, so can I, can I interrupt there. again then with a process question, um, Governor Mulhawk? Can this language reflect um, the board deciding what is deliberative? What would she say? She wants, to know if the, if the, she wants to know if the language could reflect that the board can decide what is deliberative. Sure, if you make that amendment. Go ahead, Paul. That would resolve a lot of my issues. I was going to say, it, I mean, in effect, that's <clears throat> that's what the what the board would be doing if it decides. Can you talk into the mic. Yes, that, uh, Governor McHugh, that in effect is what the board would be doing if it if it votes for a policy with a definition of deliberative information in it. You're deciding what categories of information <coughs> fall fall into that into that uh, into that category. Um, Governor that, McHugh, in, in all deference to Mr. Comer, I respectfully disagree. And the email that went out that excluded the entity heads and, and David Enzer, which I forwarded, and contrary to Lynn Wiles' uh, comment in the email that was apparently said in Dick Lobo's uh, direction, that I did forward to the entity heads as well as to David Enzer and to Carlos Garcia, um, said, you know, it's pre-decisional whatever. Well, no one on this board made that decision to exclude these people, not a single board. That was made either by my good friend, Mr. Lobo, or by someone else. Not that he did it out of malice. I don't think he ever did. I don't know who did it, but I know one thing. It wasn't the board, and and why should I, I, I be obligated to do what a staff member might sincerely want me to do, but I don't agree with uh, Mike, uh, Governor uh, Meehan. Thank you. I, I share your frustration that uh, the, the, the United States Congress in its uh, decision to, in 1994 to create this board in 1998 to make some amendments hadn't thought through all of the things that go on and, and your, your commitment as, as we do to invest a lot of your personal time and energy into the success of the board. Uh, but I also know that, that, they, that we should make efforts to address that. I struggle with some of your remarks in the following way. We have national security clearance. There are issues here that are related there. And if someone turned those over, you personally, I personally would be in trouble for that. There's a law against that. And we accept that when we accepted these posts, that there, that there is absolutely some information that cannot be shared. 
beyond the board. And so what I think this re this resolution is trying to set up a path that says um, that this there is information that, that can be shared and there's information that's not. And if a member of the board it gets the majority of the board to agree with them to make it public, we should make it public. I, I just think it's a question of of functionality. You, you you can't walk into a crowded movie house and scream fire because you have First Amendment speech protections. So I, I don't I don't see anything that we discussed that, that fall into that. I completely agree with you on whistleblower. If there was a document that came through that showed that, I, I think that there's a place for this board to deal with that and we have the power to deal with that. So so I, I'd accept your uh, on that. That that's for sure. What what I struggle with though is, is you know I actually struggle with how you enforce this as well. But but it, but I think this board can come up with its guidelines on how to deal with information and create an environment where we can have an honest conversation. I don't think I can go to my friend Senator Kerry and say that Governor Ash said X when you really said Y. That's what we're trying to prevent from happening here: is people being ascribed with positions that aren't accurate. And I think that's what Governor McHugh is saying. I, I, I want to find a way that that doesn't happen. I'm perfectly comfortable with you going telling your friends on the Capitol Hill that me and opposes the CEO or me and for the CEO, as long as it's what I said. What I oppose happening is the characterization of private, private board deliberations before we make a decision. And I think we need some self-policing on this. And I think the Congress allows us to self-police on this. I don't think you need to change the law or rewrite a law to have self-policing of the board and the ability to, to have a vote happen, and I can lose eight to one on my self-policing thing, but at least I get the presumption of be self-policed. That's, that's why I support it. Any further comments or questions? Uh, I just would like to know if this is a legal proposal or the spirit of a policy proposal, because it does, in my case, since I have to report back to the secretary on what I'm representing, I do want to be clear whether this is legal language or just policy guidance, which I think is important here. Okay, well, I think that's actually a great and perceptive question. I mean, these are ground rules that the board is, these are ground rules that the board is imposing on themselves. It's, it's a, a policy. policy. I mean, you're, you're agreeing, you would be agreeing as a board to impose these rules on yourself. So this is not, this is not something you're imposing on the public. It's not something you're imposing on any on anyone else. It's the, the governors are agreeing to abide by this set of rules. I, if, if I may, the, I mean, both the Supreme Court and the President of the United States, according to Governor Mohop's introductory remarks, both acknowledge that there is a space, you know, for this type of protection of of, of, inf of information of, of deliberative process. So I, I'm not seeing any any inconsistency with the First Amendment, since the Supreme Court probably knows something about the First Amendment, and, it, and it, it did, in fact, acknowledge that this is not a problem. And as far as whistleblowing is concerned, if I may, uh, whistleblowing has a very specific meaning. It means reporting wrongdoing to a, a law enforcement body. It doesn't mean disclosing something to the press or something like that. So I, I would find it difficult, if it was surprising myself, if if someone were to actually engage in whistleblowing and then the board decided that it wanted to punish that, you know, punish that governor or punish that staff member for, for having done that. But we could, we could put in, in this policy, in, in, we could put, Paul, yes. we could put in this policy that nothing in this policy affects any rights, ability to whistleblow, have any effect on whistleblowing protections or something to that effect, right? Or we could just say it should All be right, interpreted Mr. not Chairman. Only I'm sorry, we can't hear you here in Washington. There you go. I move it be amended uh, to say that nothing in this protocol shall negatively impact the Federal Whistleblowers Act by a member of the board or employee of uh, BBG. That's my motion. Okay, that's a motion. I second. Is all? I do, wait, Mr. Palmer, do you have it written down? I want no, to make sure you have it written let's down. Let's make sure that we as phrased. Or you can well, replay I, the tape. You know, I think I'll replay the tape because I'd like to make sure I've got the name of the statute correct and probably the legal citation. I didn't as well. put that in the statute. I just said whistleblower statute. But if you, if you want, yeah, to sign, I mean, I think that's we'd fine. have to do that. If I mean, if that's the board's wish, that, that if we're referring to a specific statute, that we actually get the name of the statute <coughs> and the citation correct. Well, I think the intention is, and however it's worded, is that we want to be clear that nothing in this affects any ability or any rights of a whistleblower or protections of a whistleblower. So whatever language is appropriate to, to, to memorialize our intention in that respect, 
Is that what you, I'm hearing from you, no. uh, Governor Ash? On so, this on narrow this, issue, um, I think the board agrees. Right. So we have a. Are you okay with that, Paul? Okay. So we have a. We've been um, moved and signed. I have a press. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Vote on that. Go, vote no, on that. no, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I have to the a amendment. question of do we need, uh, and I support Governor Ash and Governor Meehan on that amendment, oh. but um, okay. should we insert Let's, language? Should we insert language saying deliberative information as determined by the board? Well, let's, can we, we finish? On can we thinking? finish? Let's finish the. We have a motion that's been okay. made and seconded, um, amending sorry. with regard to whistleblower. So, is there further discussion? All those in favor of that amendment, say aye. Aye. Okay. So Opposed. Aye. So that is that's so agreed to. One has been adopted. That's agreed to. And Governor McHugh apparently has a question about well, a potential to, over to second you, amendment. To Governor McHugh. Do we need the clarification of deliberative information is, is to be determined by the board? Paul? I'm not sure I know what the implications are, of that are. So. Well, my, uh, are you my, saying that that's implied? Well, I, I'm saying that it's established by this by this policy. You're establishing what constitutes the, the categories of information that are that are protected by, by the policy by adopting a policy with a definition of deliberative information. You could you could expand that by saying, you know, in oh, addition to information okay. that's express, expressly determined by the board to be deliberative. But, but, no, I but mean, I what think what, well, I don't think it's addressing what Governor Ash actually has correctly raised, which is that this is for board guidance. This is not to affect public. I mean, I, I do think it's important that I'm now, I've clarified that this is to provide the board with the spirit of openness and deliberation not to restrict. So somewhere, I do think it's important to make it clear that this is to enable the board to deliberate more candidly and openly, not to restrict public discussion. So I think that is sort of what, however you deem it, this is about the board policing well, itself and enabling it to do its job better for the public. I think that's what we, I think the governor was saying. Why don't we put in here, Governor Meehan, that uh, free decision on deliberative as, to, as approved by the board, approved or disapproved? I would I'd support that, but I, but my understanding, and I, and I am not a lawyer, but is that the OMB has given the BBG clear guidance on what is pre-decisional and can be talked about ahead of time with respect to the budget. With respect to the budget, right? So so I. And so, so let's just take them one at a time. So, on the matters of the of uh, before the budget, I don't believe that this board can have a vote to overturn the 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 rules of the OMB. Uh, I don't, I'm not, as again, I'm not a lawyer, but that that's been my operational understanding. I'm sure that's the case. Uh, get briefed on what we documents here. I'm sorry. There you go. My, my you. We don't. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any of the, you know, the actual written language that would give us guidance. Which I think we've always assumed this, but until you see the written word, you don't necessarily know if there's wiggle room or not wiggle room, and on that. And uh, but I, it, it seems to me, I, I just go back to Governor Meehan. We thought we'd given clear guidance on Burma, and then apparently what we thought was clear guidance was less than clear. And I would say here, I think a majority of you feel like you're giving clear guidance to staff, but staff is going to be the one that has the rubber stamp that will say confidential pre-decisional, and only by majority of the board six weeks later, meeting as a board or doing a phone call or whatever it is, notational vote, which has to be unanimous, uh, can you undo it? And I think that's a pretty serious thing. And, you know, the issues I've been talking about, frankly, are the CEO proposal, wh whether it affects uh, entities, doesn't affect entities. That's a valid debate that is not foreign policy. It's not national security. Uh, and, and whether or not we would make a proposal or not. Uh, I guess OMB signed off on it because Lynn's up on the hill frequently pushing it, so I assume she wouldn't do it in violation of OMB. Okay. 
So, so why yeah, don't go, we? Okay, we need to bring this to a conclusion now. So, I, I just my, my question is: there are many times when the when the board directs the IBB director and by extension staff to prepare documents for the board's further consideration and deliberation. For example, uh, you did in January ask us to prepare drafts of the International Broadcasting Innovation Act. You've asked us to, to look into how to structure a CEO. You've asked us to, to look into all sorts of things. So what you're saying is, if I understand it correctly, the board would then have to first consider it and then decide that it's pre-decisional before, before it would be subject to this, to this policy. And it seems to me that the way that the board is intending for this to work, if I'm correct, is that once the board has instructed the staff to go and develop the, inf the information or the proposal or the options or whatever, that they should be subject to this policy and, and be deemed to be sub subject to it. And then after the board has actually seen it, then, then uh, the board can decide, well, let, you know, let's, it's not, it's not a free decision. We want the whole world to see it. I mean, this happens almost, almost every, I mean, um, and there are many meetings when, you know, we talk, we, we prepare, we prepare something and there is a question about, well, who, who decided to put confidential on, on top of this piece of paper? And so it's important. To which I never get an answer. Down. I mean, I emailed you five days, six days ago on this proposal saying, who, where did this come from? What are the reasons behind it? And you determined, for whatever reason, not to respond to my email. So I, I don't Sorry, have a way of, you know, if you're not going to respond, I can't make up an answer for you. I, I didn't receive your email, otherwise I would have responded. Are no. we prepared to proceed on this? Well, no, well we, need, we need some language amended um, per Under Secretary Sunshine, which is important. So how, how can we um, add that language and then come back to it? They, I agree with her. You can move it down 15 minutes because we're going to be meeting more 15 minutes. Right, you Paul can take the time now to offer to draft the amendment and offer it, and then we can, we can come do back other to business it because we do have other resolutions to act upon. Okay, I, do you understand? I mean, I'm not sure I understand what that, what it is that we're trying to achieve here. Do you? I do. Okay, I'm just asking. Yeah. Okay, but I don't understand. So. I was looking right. for a way, Frank, I was looking for a way, frankly, that we could all be in agreement on if I understood Governor Ash's concern that this is board self-regulation. This is not to impede upon anyone's ability in a congressional meeting or otherwise. So, you know, to, to be honest, I would prefer that this be something we all sign up to, or I don't think it's going to be very enforceable. I mean, my honest response is if we can find a way for this to be a consensus since it's board driven, board executed, and board monitored, and board implemented, it's very difficult if we have this as a divisive issue to then go out truly in the spirit of cooperation. So, my intent was to not introduce something to complicate it, but to see if the governor might have something that we could all sign up to. Well, uh, Secretary Sunshine, I can, I can give you my pledge that I'm willing to work with you and any others. I don't see how we do it in 10 minutes, but if you all want a special call meeting by phone in two weeks, that's fine with me too. I think we can come up with the right worry language, which would go a long ways to solving the uh, deep felt concerns that I but, uh, you know, I've I just sort of assumed by the way it was handled and the absence of, of a committee meeting that, you know, a majority clearly wanted to do what they wanted to do. And other than give a great speech, I wasn't going to do much to slow it down. And um, and it'd just be a seven to one vote. And if it is, it is. I mean, excuse me, six to one vote. Uh, and if it is, it is. Uh, but obviously, as you can tell from I've tried to be professional and be polite, but I've also been very direct and very uh, candid in where I'm coming from. And yes, I, I will openly say I think the board made a terrible mistake. I hope they'll reconsider. I hope the Hill, frankly, when they give us micromanaging, will micromanage this out of the law, of our proceedings. Uh, but I may not succeed hey, but Victor, Victor, this is Michael. Let me ask you a question, honestly. Honest, I need a really honest answer. Do we have a problem right now with leaks coming out of the various meetings we're having at the BBG, yes or no? Uh, no question about it. And some Correct. come uh, and that, of the you, private do meeting. Do you believe that problem needs to be addressed? Yes, but this doesn't do it. 
Well, this goes a lot further toward doing it than anything that's been than happening to date. All right. Well, and um, and unless we put some policy in place, and I'm perfectly happy to modify the one on the table, there is no way that we're going to be able to stop the leaks. Because to Michael Meehan's point before, normally in any other situation, when somebody leaks, they would be asked, they would be dismissed out of hand. And we can't do that here. You can't do it in any public agency. It's totally different from the well, private should, sector. I, and I, state I, agency, do it. You can. maybe you can the federal. We just let God go over now. So we lost sound again. No, I forgot to hit the button. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> you can completely be fired in any government agency for leaking. It's just because we're an independent board, we have to have a self-policing mechanism. And I completely agree with, with uh, Under Secretary that, that it would be much more reasonable if Governor Ash found a way to address this that, that you're comfortable with. I would be much more comfortable with a unanimous vote about dealing with this and addressing your concerns and I'm saying we than, than, than I am of having there. a six to one. So I would love to figure out a way to get there. And I don't know how we do it in five minutes or move it down and you uh, you and I huddle. Um, between the two of us, you move it off one. I mean, if this is deferred I accept. Tw ten days, I accept. big deal. I mean, I accept. So let's move it down and then you and I can go huddle and see if we can bring something back. Okay. Uh, well, you have to make a motion. Well, you all can go on with other items. Okay, so we'll see if the, how that goes. Um, so you guys can see what you come up with. We um, we have a numbers problem. If, if you and I leave, then we don't have a quorum, so they actually can't well, we vote on the next more, three things. We don't have any items to vote on, I don't think. Yes, we do. We have three. Oh, we have some resolutions. We'll be back for those, won't you? Well, then maybe you want to you want a ten minute recess for Michael no, to no. Or what? I, I think we should. Uh, we have only the only thing that we have that requires board votes are, are um, is the resolution. So, well, we have the travel one, which my, I've accepted Michael's proposal. Okay, Let's move on so to Mary then, Jean and switch it up. No, no, no. We're going to do action items, not reports. So you don't have an action item, Mary Jean, do you? No, just a report. No, so we're not doing we're not doing the reports right this moment. Right now, we're doing action items. So, um, yeah, you're on your travel uh, travel policy. Which well, is I'll, I'd be glad to make a blanket motion that we approve the resolution for Enders Wimbush and the travel as modified by Governor Meehan. And isn't that it? Well, if that's acceptable, if that is acceptable to the board. Uh, that we're did you does that, do you guys hear that in Washington? Yeah, yes, we agree. Are you, we agree. You okay? Well, then can we say by co by concurrence we agree to the travel policy as amended, relative as I understand it, that it excludes travel, but it, it relates to conferences. Accept uh, the conference, and on the matter of the travel, with that that uh, while we agree with the spirit of saving money, that we would go to the practical application and let the governance right. committee decide. And, and right. I would move the adoption of that resolution as amended by uh, Governor Meehan's statement, as well as the congratulatory resolution in the Okay, those exactly. are the two, and so it's a two-part motion. I'm not asking that the question be divided. Okay, fine. There, there, there's a, a motion and a second for those two things. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Opposed. That motion's agreed aye. to. So now we would gratefully ask. Uh, I move that we stand in a seven minute recess. Okay, we'll stand in a seven minute recess. Well, you guys can finish your work in seven minutes. Well, we'll, fi we'll finish it one way or the other. We'll agree or